I feel like one of the exciting pitches of this work is like, there's so many other papers that are doing similar things. We automated all of it because we are better than everyone else. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to a walkthrough of Towards Automated Circuit Discovery. I'm joined by Arthur Conmey, who was one of the authors uh, on the Interpretability in the Wild paper, and is actually joining me for the second walkthrough as my first ever repeat guest, is currently one of my math scholars, and is going to be presenting on this work he did with some collaborators partially supported in the Red Word Remix program on automated circuit discovery. Basically taking this whole mech and top thing and being like, this seems too labor intensive. How can we be lazy? Do you want to just give us the elevator pitch on like, what is this paper and why should anyone care about it? Thanks, Neil. I'm going to be presenting Towards Automated Circuit Discovery for Mechanistic Interpretability, which is a paper I worked on recently. And the idea was that we looked through several prior mechanistic interpretability projects and pulled out uh, like a common labor intensive step in all of these approaches and noted that this was not something which required like deep uh, human intuition to make progress in and therefore could like have a lot of compute thrown at it. And so we decided to like design an algorithm to automate part of this like discovery process in like mechanistic interpretability. And yeah, this, uh, this project sort of worked and our work sort of evaluates how well like automated circuit discovery approaches work as well as like in addition to um evaluating how well they work like look into the limitations and like how far we've come with automated circuit discovery so that's the paper cool and yeah just as a bit of like cultural context i feel like one of the most common criticisms i get of macintop is man you guys are just looking on a tiny model and it's really labor intensive and this will in no way scale models keep getting bigger this whole thing is totally doomed i don't think this paper like actually solves any of those concerns but it feels like you're actually trying i think one of the things i'm excited about this in this paper is like just one of the first attempts to like seriously automate some parts of mechantup and see what happens and see how fucking cursed things are maybe we should start by defining like what is a circuit Sure. So uh, in this work, uh, we sort of took the definition which we'd like sort of ran with in the interpretability in the world paper, that a circuit in like a model is a subgraph of the like computational graph uh, from input to output that that like model implements. And the circuit, this like subgraph, is responsible for like all or like pretty much all of the computation for a particular task that the model does. And we can get into the definition of task uh, later, but the a circuit is generally like a, a subgraph of the full computational graph, which includes like edge specific edge connections between different components, which like means it's more closely connected to like the prior definitions that we used in uh, like original vision model interpretability. That's what we ran within this paper for the definition of a circuit. Cool. So there's a lot of jargon in there. So I'm going to try to like break that down. The first key idea is this idea of the computational graph and computational subgraphs. We're probably going to talk a lot about the concrete example of indirect object identification in GPT-2 small. Do you want to just briefly explain like what the task is in the context of that paper? The indirect object identification task, or IOI, which we might call it, is studied in the interpretability in the wild paper for like the full set of references. And we looked at how language models complete sentences like, when John and Mary went to the store, Mary gave a bottle of milk to, with the completion, John. And John turns out to be the indirect object in the like second part of that sentence. And this is not an easy thing for language models to do because if you look at the names that occur in the sentence there's john who went to the store with mary but then mary gave a bottle of milk to and you have to predict the name which is the like le the less common name in the context so john is the name that only occurs once in the context rather than twice and that is the uh, ioi task thanks and so tbt too small was trained on a large chunk of the internet to predict the next word and this contains many, many, many subtasks. And the idea here is that indirect object identification is one specific subtask. There's the empirical claim that most of the model is not actually important for this task. The model is made up of all of these MLP layers and all of these heads, 
each one is acting in parallel on each token position. And we have the empirical observation that this is fairly sparse. Most heads and MLP layers don't matter for a task. The way we're defining a circuit here is like identifying the heads and MLP layers on which positions matter in order to do this task, and importantly, which ones don't. There's this final idea you mentioned of like edges or paths. This is a computational graph in that there are like attention heads and layers, and they compose with each other. An edge represents like this head matters because it is an input to this other head, while a node is like a head. You could describe a circuit in terms of nodes, just like these heads matter. We don't know how they connect up with each other. Or you could describe it in terms of paths or edges, like this head matters because it connects to this head and this head. These heads, despite being in different layers, do not compose with each other, so this edge does not matter. And you're saying you're describing a circuit in terms of a sparse subgraph, both in terms of edges and in terms of nodes. Yeah, I think it's worth adding to that. There are like two good reasons to care about edges quite a lot more than nodes. The first of which is that in this a sort of referenced or like original um, circuits thread, where uh, there was a bunch of uh, researchers who looked into how vision models um, compute their outputs from their input, had a definition of a circuit as a way that different features, which were just directions in the like latent space of the model, were connected across different layers by different weights that like map different features uh, in like early layers to features in, in later layers. And so this is like implicitly talking about edge connections between layers. This is not about nodes at all. So I said that's my first reason for caring about um, edges quite a lot more. And then the sort of second reason is that even if this analogy it doesn't matter, it's then you would still want to care about edges quite a lot because they track the uh, information flow through the model. So nodes are just like quite a high level like object to consider, but edges are explicitly about where information is being moved to produce the answer, which just turns out empirically to be a much more satisfying thing to study in regard to this like task specific interpretability. We want to learn how models do particular things. We end up thinking about how information flows quite a lot. Just to make that a bit more concrete, going back to this example of like vision models with interpretable neurons. We know that vision models have things like a car detecting neuron and like a car window and car body detecting neuron. And if you wanted to understand how it classifies a picture as a car, the node level answer would be like, these neurons matter. We know that the car node, car body, car window, car wheel, and car detecting neurons matter. We know they're in different layers, but we don't have any idea if they actually connect up with each other or not while the edge model is like the car neuron is computed from the car window, car body, and car wheel detecting neurons. To me, that's like more like the real ability state and algorithm. The counterpoint for why you might not care about edges is like, man, if there's n nodes, there's like about n squared edges. This is terrible. And like in some sense, massive overkill. I don't know. Uh, modes of interpretability, like go look for interpretable neurons, are fundamentally operating in the node basis. Having like gone and poked around at circuits, when all you know is like these heads matter, it's so much harder to figure out what's going on than like these heads matter because they connect with these other heads. Mm -hmm. One particular fact about transformers that make the like edges part more subtle and weird is transformers have this thing called a residual stream which some people may not think of as residual connections or skip connections. Rather than the input to layer n being the output of layer n minus one, it's the output of layer n minus one plus the input to layer n minus one, which is the same as the sum of the output of every previous layer. And this means it's really easy for things to like skip layers. Like a head in layer four matters because it composes with a head in layer nine. And if a head in layer seven matters, you have no idea if it's looking at this head in layer four or not. You can't just be like, well, this happens before that, so obviously the connections are all important. Another high-level question. Did you succeed? Have we automated interpretability? Can we all go home? Is this done? <laughs> Unfortunately, we're automating part of like mechanistic interpretability. 
Empirically, this tool has been useful to some researchers to speed up this discovery part of interpretability. But the focus of ACDC is explicitly finding the structure. And as has been stated several times, what are the important parts, the important edges? It's not about what these important edges actually do, like what they're actually computing. We think there's some evidence that this is like a very useful algorithm for speeding up the process of finding out what like edges are actually doing because you get to see what they're composing with. But uh, this is explicitly about automating one part of interpretability. So no, we still need humans in the loop, unfortunately. <laughs> cool. Uh, I want to unpack that since there's quite a lot of content in there. So there's like a couple of things that are missing here. There's like coming up with the task and the data set to study and the idea that interact object identification might be a thing you care about or any of the other tasks that you, we look at in the paper. There's understanding what the connections mean like in some sense, a sparse subgraph is like the first step of interpretability. It's not the finished product. One concrete example of this in indirect object identification is the position and name features. Like given the sentence, John and Mary went to the store, John gave the bag to, knowing that the answer is Mary, you could either compute this by saying the second name in the first clause was repeated. Or you could say John was repeated. And we find that in fact the model is using like both of these features in different subspaces. As we discussed at some point in my interpretability in the wild walk. I think the results there are in appendix A, and hopefully some of my math scholars will have a project coming out soon building on that a bunch more. But these are just like two different implementations of the same algorithm, and it's like not even determined by the structure of the circuit what the edges represent. All we know is just like, we can ignore most heads. This significantly simplifies the problem and means we can do start doing things like looking at the attention patterns of these heads and trying to see what's up. Maybe it would be good to give a bit of background on like causal interventions and the idea of activation patching, since I think that's one of the most more exciting areas that's been progress in in Macintop in the last two years. So what patching is, is like a methodology for like finding out how different components are important by replacing their activations on one forward pass of like a model with their activations from a different forward pass. And there are like two ideas here that if this is a super important component, then corrupting or like replacing its output with a um, like output from a different forward pass should probably break your model in some way, and you should be able to pick this up. And secondly, you can like target this by replacing this activation with this with the activation from a sentence which had just like one particular different name. And this can allow you to detect whether a particular component is picking up on one feature in a sentence, for example, or not. So that's the sort of patching methodology, replacing an activation from one forward pass with an activation from another forward pass. Yeah, just digging into that a bit more. So I think it's most intuitive to start with the idea of ablations or knockout or deletion. The idea is like, if you've got a neuron that matters, then deleting the neuron, setting it to zero, should mess up the model's ability to do some task. Like, if there is a car detecting neuron, deleting it should break the model's ability to detect cars. This has been around for forever. I think rich people do it in biology, where they like do knockout specific genes. The problem with ablations is it's not surgical. All it tells you is this neuron was doing something maybe relevant to the car task. Maybe deleting the neuron breaks every task. Maybe it was detecting the wheels. Maybe it was detecting that it was like shiny. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But we can track this down. Like, if we took the neurons, rather than setting the neurons' value to zero, we can set the neurons' value to its average on lots of data. That's, like, slightly better. That's called a mean ablation. If the model was really used to the neuron being, like, three, and you set it to zero, and that broke everything, that's not super interesting. But you could also do this further. Like, if you think the neuron is detecting things that are shiny, you could replace it's not with zero or with the mean, but with its value on some other shiny input, like an iPhone or something. If replacing it with its value on the iPhone doesn't break things, 
but zero blading it does, then that's evidence that it's representing shininess, not something about cars in general. And if replacing it with something that's furry does break things, that's even stronger evidence that, like, you're actually tracking down the feature involved. Do you want to explain the idea of a clean and corrupted distribution, and maybe just walk people through the methodology you used in the IOI paper? Sure. So and this would be pretty closely related to what's happening in the, like, ACDC paper. So I can bring up, I guess, a table where we have a number of, like, tasks and their clean distribution. But specific to this IOI task, we had the sentences that I discussed before, such as, like, John and Mary going to the store and Mary giving a bottle of milk to, which is completed with John. What does the underscore before John mean? Oh, it just emphasizing the fact that tokens have a space at the start was the d design decision in this um, figure. It's cl clarified in the caption to the figure. But uh, when we have this clean prompt, meaning um, a prompt that has this particular task where there's an indirect object to be identified, we can also have a corrupted distribution, which is a set of like prompts where this behavior of detecting the indirect object is not present. So for example, you could replace this prompt with a prompt that goes when Alice and Bob went to the store, Charlie gave a bottle of milk to. And this would is like the same at every token position, except it now has three different names. And the reason this is helpful is now this is this essentially the same prompt, but without that indirect object task present in the prompt. And so we can then like replace our model components by this patching methodology with their activations on this Alice, Bob, Charlie prompt. And then we can get some signal on whether this particular model component is actually doing something that's specific to this indirect object identification task, or it's something that is like quite different, such as being completely useless or being about detecting that names should be predicted which is also present in the Alice, Bob, Charlie prompt. So that's the idea of a clean and corrupted prompt. And yeah, there's a lot of nuance in choosing the right clean and corrupted prompts. Like, for example, the in the thing you mentioned, if there's a head whose job is to, like, figure out that the first name was John and move that to the two token position, that's going to show up a lot. While if instead you had the corrupted prompt when John and Mary went to the store, John gave a bottle of milk to it's controlling for everything apart from the bits around what is a repeated name. You could even have when John and Mary went to the store, Mary gave a bottle of milk to, versus when Alice and Bob went to the store, Al um, Bob gave a bottle of milk to, where it's mm -hmm. got the same positions, but it's got different names. And you're testing, like, if a patch preserves things, that suggests that that patch has, like, contains the information about whether the repeated name was the first or second name. We're mostly not going to get into the nuances of choosing the right clean and corrupted distribution, but I think it's like pretty important, though mm -hmm. here you kind of take it as a given. Yep, this seems true. And it, I guess the general lesson here is just this patching technique is just super powerful because often we have like theories about how neural networks work, but it's very crucial to like touch reality and actually test those theories. And patching is just like one of the fastest and most direct ways of testing that you your uh, like given hypothesis is actually true because it should like remain true when you perform certain patches, but not when you perform certain other patches. And so that's like sort of why this stuff is powerful. Yeah, I think one nuance that often isn't obvious to people is that there's kind of several families of techniques or philosophies in Mechantup. One pretty big one is what I call the difference between general and specific Mechantup, or distribution independent universal Mechantup, and distribution dependent Mechantup, where the idea here is when we say this head is important for indirect object identification because it moves names, it attends to John and copies that to the output. We're not saying that's all the head does. We're saying that's like the thing it does on the narrow distribution of clean and corrupted prompts where the IOI task matters. And this is like an interesting but weaker statement. And you could instead try to make the statement that it's like, in general, this head's job is like doing indirect object identification. 
if it is doing anything, it is that. Otherwise, it's just off. Uh, unfortunately, this seems to not be true, and those heads do many different things, which is called being polysemantic, uh, and it's very sad. The causal interventions family of work gives outputs that look more like a kind of subgraph of the model's computational graph, but don't necessarily tell you, like, what is the actual algorithm? They aren't, like, reverse engineering the algorithm from the model's weights into something human readable. Mm -hmm. It's closer to, like, taking the model as it is and simplifying it and saying what levels of simplification you're allowed. And I think these are both legitimate kinds of work, but these are, like, different and they have different strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And I put ACDC mostly in the specific distribution dependent camp. Does that seem fair? Oh, yeah, it's, like, very strongly in that camp, I would say. Whereas cool. it's worth pointing out that, yeah, there are just very different ways you can do interpretability and that, like, to some extent, like, support this general direction. Like, it's complementary. But if you are trying to understand, like, for example, neurons or combinations of neurons and what they do on, like, all of the language modeling distribution, you would, in general, be doing something pretty different to what we're doing here. And similarly, if you were studying sort of, like, toy algorithmic tasks where you you know like exactly the whole task they're like doing rather than them being like a language model where they're just like trying to fit the whole of the internet which is a crazily large distribution then we're essentially just doing very different things to the sort of general scope of this paper because this is like specifically looking for these tasks and then trying to understand how those tasks are implemented a final assumption to call out is this idea that we can look at subgraphs of the model's computational graph the idea that, like, only certain heads matter for a task is, like, kind of non-trivial. And there's a growing body of work around the weird-ass phenomena of superposition, where models, rather than having specialized components or, like, specialized neurons or directions, seem to use combinations of neurons to achieve things. We're still pretty confused about how this works, and in practice it seems to be the case that for, like, most circuits we've looked at, things are kind of sparse. It's not that, like, every head is used to do IOI. It's that some heads matter a lot and many heads don't. But mm. this is another assumption being made here. And the idea that you have the right set of units to play with is not obviously true. Yep. It's still very much a live area of research that you can see my walkthroughs on toy models of superposition or finding neurons in a haystack to learn more. Do you want to briefly walk us through the other tasks in the table? I feel like one of the exciting pitches of this work is like, there's so many other papers that are doing similar things. We automated all of it because we are better than everyone else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is like the hope for like automated interp, that we can go beyond just incredible, these specific case studies. So a number of the other like tasks that we uh, like looked at were predicting doc strings in Python code, computing a greater than operation. We looked at two tasks, which were pretty toy tasks in this tracer programming language. Tra tracer is a paper from the DeepMind Mechanistic Interoperability team, whoop, whoop, uh, from David Lindner. And the idea is that you have this formal language where you can write down an algorithm and then tracer compiles that to transformer weights and gives you an actual like transformer you can run. There's no need to understand their whole end-to-end -end process. You can just sort of see here that in the two tasks, they compute the proportion of Xs in a given list at each position, and they reverse lists. There's no need to understand, like, the whole, like, algorithm to, for doing this. It's just all you need to understand is that there is some task here, and this, like, previous work from the team as DeepMind was able to, like, turn this task into the weights of a transformer and uh, the transform will then perform that task. Well, Finally, sorry, the, for the X proportion on four is like, wait, yeah. how do you get zero? Like, why does A correspond to zero rather than a quarter? Ah, uh, it's tracer X proportion, because it's computing the proportion of Xs in each prefix. Ah. So the proportion of Xs at the A position, I guess I'll zoom in to make it clearer what's happening in these two tasks. The proportion of Xs at this prefix is zero, it's then half at this position, it's then a third at this position, and then a half again at the end position, because we have another x. And 
if people have played with transformers or thought about them, this is the exact kind of task that are like a causal transformer is pretty good at solving. And you can do this with like uh, attention heads quite easily. But the contribution of this tracer work was to turn writing an algorithm to do this into literal transformer weights. And this was pretty convenient for uh, like a quick validation of the techniques in the ACDC paper. And then we close off with the final task, which is this uh, induction task on natural language, which is considerably more general than the other tasks. But this is where you have a sentence such as Vernon does Lee and Petunia does Lee. And the final Lee completion is a copy of a B token in an A, B, A, B pattern, because we previously saw the two tokens, der and li, and we will again see that same uh, first token, ders, which is completed with li, because of the way that transformer tokenizers are weird, and they turn out to not recognize the full ders li word as a token, but they split it into these two ders and li tokens. Nice. And yeah, induction heads are like a really, really big deal in models, in a way that may not be quite obvious at first glance. You can go check out my walkthrough with Charles Fry on in context learning and induction heads. But like very brief intuition. I'm not sure Dursley is a good example, because you could just do this with bigrams. Like mm -hmm. Durs is often followed by Lee. But you could imagine if you had Petunia and you want to know what comes next. There's like lots of things that could come next. Petunia is like actually Petunia is a name I've only ever seen in the context of Harry Potter. But like I'm sure Petunia is used in other contexts. But if you know that Petunia Dursley occurred in the past, it's like Obviously, Dursley's going to come next. That's not an amazing example, because basically it's like Petunia, comma, or something, but whatever. Repeated text is like really, really common, and induction heads are a really big part of how these models work. And yeah, just in terms of like contextualizing this in the literature, I'd say IOI, greater than, and docstring are actual like paper level works that try doing this. IOI was published at iClear, and tracer and induction are more like things you could apply the causal abstractions line of work to more so than like that was the point of the papers yeah yeah and so just to close off on the greater than and doc string examples the um doc string example was studied in a four layer transformer so somewhat smaller than gpt2 small uh, attention only four layer Yes, the attention only model. And this was the task where when you're given a Python doc string, as an example, one here with many different arguments, such as self, files, object, state, size, shape, and option. When a doc string is written in this standardized form, I think it's like a Google internal form of doc strings, then there's a predictable pattern where if you have first state and then size as params with doc strings, since if you look at the arguments, there are state, size, and then shape, the model should predict shape as the next token. So this is somewhat induction flavored, though it is not exactly identical to induction, but this was another task which people reverse engineered and followed a similar patching methodology that we will get into. Yep, from Stefan Heimersheim and Jack Janiak, two of my previous math scholars. Whoop, whoop. And Stefan yeah. was an author on this paper as well, so it was helpful for his um, input on that uh, task. And then the greater than task was another task in GBD2 Small from the Remix program, where the authors looked at sentences such as, the war lasted from 1517 to 15, and these are completed with 1518 or 19, or any number that's larger than 17, or equal to 17, in fact. But it is not completed with completions such as the war lasted from 1517 to 1512, or some number less than 17, because this doesn't make any sense. And even the small language models can do this, and so they reverse engineered how the models were able to tell whether certain completions were greater than this 17 or not. So yeah, zooming out a bit, how big an advance is this? How useful is the algorithm in practice? So I think it's a pretty useful contribution to notice that a lot of previous work was using a common methodology and expending quite a lot of labor or time on that methodology. And I'm happy that we have like a write-up where we just go through how there are just like intense similarities between a bunch of previous works 
and a common like algorithm which can just like re rederive these important parts of these circuits. And this was certainly my motivation with the work. And this is going to be like explained in like ACDC algorithm, which is like illustrated here, which given just like a setup as in the table, you can then find the like sparse subgraph of connections that is the subgraph that like computes the task. And so this has not been done before. People hadn't tried automating this. And I don't think anyone had been like extracting subnetworks for interpretability purposes. So I think this was like the first work on that sort of like track. And we also introduced a bunch of like benchmarks or like ways to measure how good circuit discovery is that we think are pretty exciting. But this is far from the like final <laughs> point in the like story of automating interp because there are a ton of stuff we need to improve on. And we think it's like pretty exciting to hopefully have more people working on speeding this up and like uh, generating new circuit discovery algorithms. So that's the sort of concrete contribution, but that's also a set of the limitations and the like future work that needs to be done with uh, automating this circuit discovery process. Thanks. Yeah, one of the things I really like about the paper is kind of its role as like a literature review. Like here are the circuits that we think we understand. Here is an independent validation of how good they are. Here is our best guesses for how to measure these circuits and like a bunch of comprehensive studies of these. I think this is just like a really solid contribution. I quite liked figure one and mm. the fairly evocative, oh, we took out the IOI circuit of GPD-2 small. Automating works. Mm. I guess I don't know how legit this circuit figure actually is, mm. but you're the IOI author here. Sure. So this is the sort of figure one of what, in an idealized setting, this sort of ACDC approach does, is take like a computational graph of a model such as GP2 small, which I think in this case had a 32,000 connections of like <laughs> particular edges. And in fact, I think it had so many that it blew up our plotting software. And so if you look closely, this doesn't include 32,000 edges and like doesn't include every single connection between earlier and later layers. But oh, um, we hope... Outrageous lack of research efforts. I'm very <laughs> we, we hope the <laughs> community forgives us because we're essentially <laughs> underselling our approach in some ways because there's really <laughs> far more edges than this. But that's how I would say it. And given such like a massive subgraph, um, our algorithm, so this ACDC algorithm, is able to then extract an end-to-end -end subgraph of edges that are important for the IOI task. Of these, I think it's um, about 30, I can't remember the number of connections, it's below 100, I believe, and all the nodes present here were identified in the IOI paper as uh, important for computing the indirect object. And it also contains like a sufficient pathway through the model to do indirect object identification because it includes a, like a duplicate token head uh, that goes into a S inhibition head. And this is essentially the mechanism that detects that Mary, in the sentence John and Mary, the store and Mary gave a bottle of milk to, has been like repeated. This is the detection of the repeated Mary, and then a composition into the name mover heads. So the like layer nine head nine, which then writes that to the output. This is also um, through a connection to the uh, like MLP zero, which we identified as pretty important for like encoding what the names were. And in the rest of the work, we'll see diagrams that are a bit messier than this, but that also include all the like Q, K, and V connections through query, key, and value. But uh, for sake of a clean diagram, these are like hidden in this particular one. But this is the sufficient circuit to complete uh, IOI that's discovered entirely by like an algorithm rather than human intervention. Nice. Yeah, I'm curious what algorithm you used to make this. It's a pretty looking diagram. Uh, I believe we use the library PyGraphVis, and uh, it's just a Python uh, graphing library. Uh, it, yeah, it turned out to have like a ton of like, very nice features, actually. One thing we really liked was that even for obscenely large graphs, it could handle the like number of edges present. So the full IOI circuit, which we gave a picture of for the reader, has a large number of heads. There are 26 heads in it, and we included all MLPs as well, and then the pie graph <laughs> can handle it. So it looks horrific, even with color coding for what they like represent. It. But 
Pi shout out to Pi Graph Viz for being able to include uh, all these edges in one given diagram. Wait a minute, do you just have every MLP layer in there? Yes, I believe That's we only Jesus. had the connections between like MLPs and like the next set of components after that. Like the MLPs only fed into the name movers, as far as I remember, but all MLPs were present at some point here, yes. All right, to close off part one, do you want to just briefly explain how the ACD algorithm works? Sure. So as a quick overview of the three steps of ACDC, we can illustrate with the figure two from the paper, which begins with the first step of choosing a computational graph, a task, and one hyperparameter, which is a threshold. So this is just what we've discussed in the table of selecting a like model, as well as selecting the task like IOI, which comes with like a data set, and a threshold tau. And it's also important at this point to select some like patching data set. So this Alice, Bob, and Charlie data set needs also be selected at the first step. And then secondly, we uh, can look at a given node in our graph, and then we can prune the incoming connections. So what happens here is we uh, remove a connection as illustrated by like the scissors from B to O. We remove a connection and measure how much the task still occurs in the model. And then if that task uh, like degrades by more than tau, so this was a destructive intervention by patching the edge BO to the corrupted distribution. So this is a lot of definitions here, but you might want to just like take the high level and we'll go into it all later. Then we would not include the BO if it did not have larger than tau effect on the task present. So like the IOI pass. And then this is a description of what we can do at a given node O. We can then recurse this process through every single node in the computational graph. And at the end, we get like an end-to-end -end computational subgraph that hopefully is able to just do the IOI task in this example. And this methodology like generalizes to a huge number of works, such as the ones we uh, discussed in the table. So that's the high-level summary. And uh, we'll actually get into making this comprehensible in the next part, I think. Just to try repeating that back, the core operation here is we can take and set some edges in our graph and like noise them or resample ablate them. Mm -hmm. So the model sees an edge from the corrupted distribution rather than clean. We start with the null hypothesis that every edge matters, and then we pick some node and we recurse. And we're like, for every edge feeding into this node, let's try just deleting that on top of the edges we're already deleting, and let's see if this does anything. And if it does something, then you're like, great. If this does something more than your threshold to tau, you're like, great, this edge matters. Otherwise, mm. delete it. And <laughs> then you just keep the important edges for this node, then you pick and the next node, and you keep going until you've yep. gone through the entire graph. Exactly right. Awesome. Uh, in that case, let's move on to part two.